What a joy it is to be in the house of the Lord. Yeah, it's good. David said, I was exuberant when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. As Jesus walked on earth and as he taught on earth, even though a clear majority of people were amazed and drawn towards his teachings, there was a group of people who put up a stiff resistance to his teachings and criticized him at every opportunity they got. So at one point, when Jesus was teaching, he makes this very unique statement in John chapter 15, verse 22. Jesus says, he says, if I had not come, he said, if I had not come. So I'd like to take a few moments and explore the repercussions of the statement that Jesus made, if I had not come. So if Jesus had not come to the earth, what would our world be like today? That would be quite a, uh, a very dark prospect to explore, but I thought it would it'd be good for us to take a few moments and think about it. And the most obvious uh, repercussion that I could start with would be, uh, if Jesus had not come, then history would have been one-dimensional. There would never have been a B.C. and A.D. It would have been a pretty much a flat. There would have not been more content to our history. If Jesus had not come, we would not have more than half of the resources and books that we have today in circulation because so much of wisdom that is around today is gleaned from words of Christ and what he taught in the Beatitudes and, and what he taught among the disciples as well. If Christ had not come, we would never have heard about the incredible influence that Christianity has had upon the world today. We, Paul the Apostle would have been a uh, fierce Pharisee. And Peter, James, and John would have just been simple fishermen who lived and died without any name or without having done anything of significance. If Christ had not come, there would not be any churches can you imagine a city or a nation where there was no place for a group of people to gather together and fellowship and rejoice and have such great time of honoring God? It would be such an incredible tragedy. And if Christ had not come, there would be no New Testaments. The Bible would have finished with the book of Malachi where the last verse says, Lest I come and smite you. That was the only promise you could tell one another, lest God comes and smite you. We would have had nothing further than that in, in our record in our Bible. If Christ had not come, and this is a serious one, uh, sin would have no remission. There would be no forgiveness for sin. And the weight of sin would have been so huge of a burden upon man and it would have weighed on us and until it, it killed us literally. That's what would have happened if Christ had not come. And I would say if Christ had not come, then there would be no such thing as resurrection, meaning death would not only be a fearful thing, but all of us would have been looking forward to a very bleak future, nothing to look forward to. If Christ had not come, most of the institutions that we see of great higher learning would not be around. I'm talking about Stanford. I'm talking about Harvard. I'm talking about so many of these prestigious uh, learning centers which were established to actually equip and train people to preach the gospel. That's how they began. We would never have those things. If Christ had not come, there would not have been... Half of the hospitals and medical centers that we have today that was reaching out and helping people and helping find cures for sickness and diseases. If Christ had not come, there would be no YMCA. There would be no Red Cross. There would not be any orphanages. There would never be any acts of services that people would do that would, you know, take their eyes of themselves and fix it on someone. There would be no compassion ministries in our world today. I could go on all morning and talk about all the things and repercussions of life if Christ had not come. If Jesus had not come, we would be a people living in perpetual darkness, oppressed by sin, bondages and curses. And I cannot fathom the depravity of man if Christ had not come to planet Earth. But the most amazing message of Christmas is Christ did come. He did. 
God set aside his divinity and came down to earth with one purpose, which was to seek and to save those that were lost and without hope. God's love for mankind was so great that he did not abandon us. He did not leave us to be slaves to the ruler of this darkness. Jesus said, I have come to declare good news to set the captives free and declare that this is the year of the freedom of God. And Christ came to set us free. And because Christ came, you and I are seated here this morning. Your friendships, your relationships that you have, the things that you value in your life would not be possible if not for the fact that 2,000 years ago, God took on the form of a human being and came down to earth as a helpless baby with one purpose. It is to make a way back to God again through his life and through his death and resurrection, make the penalty of sin paid for us on our behalf. Come on, I think Jesus deserves a round of applause this morning. What an amazing God. To consider the possibility of Him not having come is quite a bleak possibility. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Galatians chapter 4. And I want us to read a portion of Scripture in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 onwards. This is what the Apostle Paul writes, and he says, But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law, so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. Can you say an amen to that? I want to dwell on this incredible theological discussion that Paul makes with the church in Galatia. And he starts this statement with, when the right time came. So I want to start with looking at the meaning of that statement, when the right time came. I love that statement that Apostle Paul makes when he says, you know, when the right time came, God sent his son. Now, all of us would, would agree there's something um, great or precious about doing things at the right time. Actually, when you do something at the right time, it makes sense. Thanks to my, to my daughter, Evelyn, the meaning of this statement um, is, hits closer to home for me. Evelyn is now old enough uh, to pick up on when something is afoot or when we're about to get ready to leave home. And I have made the mistake of telling her too soon what we're about to do. One day, I told her as soon as she woke up, I said, hey, Evie, today I am going to get you ice cream at the store. And from that moment when I said this statement to her, without ceasing, and I don't know where she picked up this statement from, but she repeated to me and Abby this statement, are you ready, guys? Are you ready, guys? And trust me, after the 15th time of her saying it, it stopped being cute. (laughs) So after that incident, she is given information strictly on a need-to-know basis only. It's because my daughter cannot understand that as parents, there are preparations to be made before we do something. We can't just leave the house in a whim like we used to. With a child, there are a hundred things to be done and taken care of before we head out the door. But when all the preparation is done is when the right time comes to leave. Do you see what I'm meaning? So Paul the Apostle invites us to consider 
this timing of God. When the right time came. Another translation actually says, when the time had fully come, is what another translation says. And this phrase, had fully come, is a very picturesque Greek expression. It speaks of something that is completely and fully developed. It's like a ripe apple that is ready to be eaten. Or it's like a pregnant woman who is ready to give birth to something. And it describes a moment in history when all the things were in place, when all the pieces of the puzzles had been put on the board, and that one moment when the stage was set, and at that moment, not a moment earlier, not a moment later, is when God sent forth His Son, Paul says. God's timing is perfect. We know that because we know the Bible. He's never early, and He's never... And yet, this timing of God staggers us. When, when He does something that we weren't expecting Him to do, we're like, God, why did you do that? And then when we want Him to do something, and He doesn't do it, and heaven looks like it's you know, all brass and we can't get through, we get frustrated, our faith is brought under question, the actual existence of God is brought under question, does God care does God exist when he does not do things when we expect him to do things see the Jews or the Jewish nation also had similar kind of concerns during the birth of Jesus Christ because there had been so many prophetic utterances there had been so many promises that were made from the beginning of of time from the beginning of the Bible, that all these devout Jews had studied and had memorized all their life. And I want to, for a few moments, touch on some of the predictions that we can see in the Bible that talk about the arrival of Jesus Christ. If you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, when God says to Eve, your seed shall trample underfoot the enemy, so Eve did not fully comprehend or understand what God meant by that. But what God meant by that was the seed of Eve, meaning Christ, would actually put under his foot the work of the enemy, of Satan. So right at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 3, there is a mention of Christ that is to come. So any devout Jew who would study, any Pharisee, any Sadducee who had learned the, 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 the law, who had, who had actually studied the, the Abrahamic covenants would know the prophetic words that had been spoken. And another incident in Genesis chapter 12, God comes to Abraham and he says to Abraham in the first three verses, he says to Abraham, I'm going to bless you and through your descendants, the entire earth is going to be blessed, he said. Now, you would think that is implying to, to Isaac that God gave, but how could God bless the whole earth to Isaac? So again, God was speaking code there to, to Abraham. He's saying, hey, there is going to be someone down the line, a descendant of yours, that is going to come, and through that descendant, the whole earth is going to be blessed, God says. And then you move on to Genesis 49, verse 10. God again gives another prophetic utterance, and He says to this person, He says, the scepter of rulership will arise from Judah. Meaning, Christ, the King, the Messiah, would be born through the tribe of Judah. So again, those who study the law would make a note of it. And then hundreds of years later, God comes to King David, a prominent ruler in the history of Israel. And God says to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 onwards, and He says, Hey, David, one day, one of your son is going to sit on the throne. And he's going to reign, but his reign is going to be an everlasting reign, God says. David makes a note of it. All the people studying the prof prophecy says, hey, this is, this is it's not talking about a human being. It's talking about something more than a human being. So all of these promises that began right from Adam, right through Abraham, then narrows down to the house of Judah, which was the house of David, and then God again speaks through prophet Micah. In Micah chapter 5, verse 2, God says, This 
amazing Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, in a town called Bethlehem, he says. Again, prophetic word about the, about the arrival of the Messiah. And then God even goes even further and gives even more clear description to Daniel. To Daniel, he comes in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 onwards. God actually gives Daniel a prophetic revelation of the specific time when they could expect the Messiah to be arriving into the world. So all of this throughout the Old Testament were prophetic utterances of, of, of the arrival of the Messiah. And I've only given you a small little glimpse of it. There's so many more scriptures we don't have time to of all the different prophetic utterances that are found in the law of God, in the word of God, talking about the arrival of the Messiah. And then right after Micah stands up and prophesies where the location of the birth of Messiah would be, there's silence. For about 433 years, there was total silence on earth. So after Micah the prophet prophesied, it seemed like heavens closed down. And God stopped communicating with people. So for 400 years, and this is what the, the Bible refers to, or scholars refer to as the silent years. Meaning for 400 years, there was not one person who rose up and spoke another prophetic word. Imagine you being in that generation that lived in those 400 years, and you lived and grew up in that 400 years. You've heard about all the prophetic words that have been spoken, and you are living in that time, and nothing is being done. Nothing seems to be happening. They're living in a time where it seems like God is no longer communicating with His people. God doesn't seem to care about the plight of His people. Imagine the kind of Fear and uncertainty the people would have lived in that time period of 400 years. But this is a truth that we must remind ourselves often, especially when things look bleak and hopeless. Just because it appears that nothing is happening in the natural does not mean nothing is happening in the supernatural. I think it has to do with how we relate to God. Since we live in a natural and finite world, we view God as someone who can only operate in the natural and in the finite realm. But our God, who is a maker of heaven and earth, not only operates in the natural, but He operates in the supernatural. He is not a finite God. He is an infinite God, meaning He operates without restrictions of the world. There is nothing that can limit God, restrict God, stop God, or hinder God. Our God is unstoppable. What He determines to do, He will do what He wants to do. There's no one on earth, no one on, on the entire universe that can stop, hinder or try to oppose what God wants to do in our lives. And in those 400 years of silence, to those generations that lived, it might have appeared like nothing was happening, but yet God was still working something amazing behind the scenes. See, just because things don't appear to be happening the way you expect them to happen, doesn't mean you give up on your faith. That's when you dig deeper. That's when you put your foot down stronger and say, even though what I see and what I experience does not match what I have received as promises, I'm going to stand right here and I'm going to dig my heel deeper because I know that my God who promised these things is true and faithful to do what He said He would do and my God will not go past without doing what He said He would do in my life. Come on someone. That's an assurance. That's a promise that you have in your life that regardless of what your situation may seem or what it may appear to be right now, our God is greater. He is stronger. He is still at work. I love this scripture in Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3. And the Bible says in Habakkuk 2 verse 3, it says, it seems slow in coming, wait patiently, for it will surely take place 
It will not be delayed. The Bible says, for it may seem slow in coming, wait patiently. That's exactly like my daughter, Evelyn. From the moment the promise of the ice cream is given to the time that the promise is fulfilled, to Evelyn, the world stops spinning. It's like everyone is walking in slow motion. Nothing is happening in her world. Have you ever been there? Have you ever experienced what I'm talking about? Like you're waiting for this promise to happen, and it's like the whole world stopped revolving. And it's like, why isn't my life moving? Why aren't things happening the way they're supposed to happen? Why aren't things falling into place like they should have by now? And you're looking around and say, everyone is moving forward. And I am stuck in this perpetual universe where nothing seems to be happening or going in my way. And the word of the Lord from Habakkuk comes to you and it says, It may seem like it is slow in coming. Wait patiently for the God who promised will show surely make it happen and come to pass in your life and that's an assurance and that's something you got to remind yourself often it may appear it may seem slow god says he says it may seem like it is slow in coming and i love this god knew what our trouble is god knows what we're going through and he says he says for it will surely take place and then the last statement he says is it will not be delayed Oh, hallelujah. Come on, someone. It will not be delayed. You think it's late? God says, no, 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 no. It will not be delayed. It may seem like it's coming slow, but when it happens, it will be right on cue with everything that God is setting up in your life for what he's about to do. Come on, touch your neighbor and say, it will not be delayed. It will not be delayed. It will surely happen. Hold on to your faith. Hold on to the promise. Don't give up. Don't give in. Dig deep because the one who promised is faithful to do what he said he would do. Now, I want to look at the second part of, of that scripture. is how God prepared the world. How God prepared the world for the arrival of, of his son. <coughs> Many times we miss the significance of the behind-the-scenes work that is done by God before things are brought out in the open. There's a lot of stuff that happens behind the scenes. You know, when the President of the United States plans to visit a country or a place, there are several teams and several levels of planning and coordinating that happens. It's common practice for we know when the government sends their president overseas to any other country, they actually fly with the president all the cars that he needs. Like, you know, you're talking about two or three cars that fly along or more that fly along with the whole convoy just so that when the president touches ground in wherever he is in any part of the continent of Africa, the moment he steps out of his airplane, his car from the U.S. is waiting for him there. And then also, he, he flies in this Air Force One, which is a pretty sophisticated aircraft, and they don't even have just one, they have two. So when, when he flies in one, there's another one flying right behind, in case the first one has a flat tire, the second one can help fly. And when he lands into a country, and from the moment he touches ground to the moment he gets back into the aircraft and takes off, every minute of his day is perfectly planned. Where he stops, where he goes, who he talks to, when is the photograph moment. Every part of his day is absolutely to the minute planned and programmed. Now think about it for a moment. If a human being who is a president of a nation that is wealthy would have so much planning and so much preparation for him to visit a country, the God of the universe sends his son to visit planet Earth don't you think he will do a little bit of planning and preparation for his visit? <laughs> if a human being requires so much preparation, the Son of God had a lot of preparation done for his arrival. We don't see it. We don't read about it. But as you see and, and read in the Word of God, it becomes clear that God didn't just happen to show up on planet Earth. There was a precise 
planning that took place on the part of the kingdom of God on when and how his son would be revealed. And I'm, I'm, I'm relating this to us as well. And this is something you got to remember. When the time had fully come implies that there are certain things that God does in our lives that may not be evident on the outside, that you may not even be able to recognize, but God is still working things on the inside because the time will come when he has put everything in place and then he displays his glory and splendor. But the, the behind the scenes work is boring work. Talk to our team who sings, who sings on, the, on the platform. They might be up here for about 25, 30 minutes on a Sunday, but ask them how long they prepare behind the scenes for that 30 minutes. Thank you. It's like eternity. Is that what it seemed like? Okay. They spend a long, long time that you and I don't see. You just come here and say, man, he's really off key there. But you don't know how much work has been done in preparation for what they are doing. Come on, someone. I'm getting to something I'm trying to teach you here this morning. There's things happening in your life right now that may seem mundane and boring, but those mundane and boring things are actually the steps of destiny that God is putting in your life for when the time is fully come, His display of glory and splendor will be mighty in your life. Because those are the small things, everyday things that sets you up for mighty things for the kingdom of God. You know, take the Roman Empire, for example. It was not by chance that Jesus was born during the rule of the Roman Empire. It is historically recorded that only twice in the history of the Roman Empire, the doors of the temple Janus, which was the god of war, was closed. So the second time they had closed the doors of, of, of the temple of Janus was when Jesus was born. And what does that mean? It meant that when the temple doors of war were closed, that meant the empire was at peace. There was no war going on. The only time they would open the doors of the temple was when they needed the favor of their gods for winning the war. And when the temple doors were closed, that meant their empire was not at war anywhere. So the time when Jesus was born, the temple doors of the Roman Empire to their god of war was closed, implying the entire Roman Empire was at peace. There was a kind of a stillness in the Roman Empire when Jesus was born. Have you ever heard the phrase, all roads lead to Rome? Yeah. That was God. God allowed the Roman Empire to be so powerful, to have so much dominion over the then world for one reason. Because he wanted these heathen people to build world-class road connectivity to the entire then world. Even today, people study the historical significance of the Roman wor world road connectivity because it was so good. Why? God wanted them to lay the road because he knew the time would come when the gospel would be preached and he would need his apostles and his evangelists and his preachers to be able to have access to every town, every village, every little place. And because of that, God says, I'm going to time it so that my son will be born in one of the times when it's the most easy to access every corner of the world. Don't think for, an, for a moment that Jesus was born during the Roman Empire by chance, by accident. God meticulously planned it. I'm the only one who's impressed by that. <laughs> Consider Judaism. See, during those 400 years of, of silence, Jews had migrated to every corner of the ancient world. Judaism flourished. And as a result, what did the Jews do? They built synagogues in every town, in every village they went to. They built synagogues and places of worship wherever they went through. And they were spread throughout the whole world. And where did Christianity emerge from? It emerged from Judaism, from within Judaism. Jesus was born to a Jewish family in a Jewish nation. And Jesus made sure that the invitation to the salvation was first extended to the, to the Jews, God's chosen people, and then to the people of the world. So when the gospel was preached, the early church took 
a lot of the practices that were already prevalent in the Jewish synagogues and adopted it into their practice as well, in the, in, in, in the way of gathering together. So when Apostle Paul traveled to all the different parts of Asia Minor and every part of, of the then world, where does the Bible say he preached? In the synagogues. Which was established when? During the 400 years of what appeared to be silence, God was secretly placing strategically synagogues in different parts of the entire world. So when the time comes for the message of the gospel to be taken out, there would be a synagogue in every city, in every town, in every village, so that the apostles could enter that place. And there would already be a people group who would gather in that place. And they would have a ready-made platform to stand up and preach the gospel to all these Jews and say, Jesus lived loved you, came for you, died for you, come on, get saved, and miracles would happen, and the kingdom of God advance. Yes. Consider then the moral atmosphere or the decline of morality during that period. See, the gods of Greece and Rome could no longer command the blind allegiance of, of the masses. Education philosophy and, and, and great art was at its peak during the time of the birth of Jesus Christ. And, and basically in the, in the Roman and in also in, in, in the Athenian culture, there was great philosophers that you and I know, Socrates from, from Athens, Aristotle from Athens, you know, and Rome produced people like Cicero, Julius Caesar, and, and, and many other philosophers who were teaching people different philosophies. But the best man, that, the best that the man could do was not enough. Meaning there was such an unrest and an a emptiness within people even though there was so much learning. There was so much knowledge that was prevalent. There was still an incredible emptiness within man at that time. And that's why when Paul, when he was preaching, he goes up to this place in Greece, which is called the Mars Hill, and he looks at a place in Mars Hill where there was a stone that was dedicated, and it says, to the unknown God. And what it implied was, all of these Greeks, even though they were scholars, even though they were learned men, they still had that sense of, we're still missing someone here that is part of the puzzle. We're still missing, there's someone that is still needs to be brought in and we're searching for it and that was kind of a spiritual atmosphere in the entire globe at that time there was a sense of emptiness and frustration and yet there was such a fullness of knowledge culture and arts the roman culture today is still studied as one of the best cultures in the world and yet even in that time period there was a sense of emptiness when you read some of the writings, the historical writings of the Roman poets, you get a, a glimpse of the moral decay in that day, in that generation. There was gross superstition, debased immorality, widespread corruption and evil that was just rampant. And this was the kind of world that Christ stepped into. Paul the Apostle describes in the book of Romans and he, and he depicts beautifully, and he says in Romans chapter 1, he says, a world that knew the truth but suppressed it. It ignored the true God and turned to idolatry. It was a world that was given over to, to paganism, sexual immorality, homosexuality, murder, perversion, dishonesty, brutality, a world of broken promises, broken dreams, broken homes, broken hearts, does that sound familiar? Similar to the kind of world that we're living in today. And into that darkness, God shines a light in a stable in Bethlehem and says, I waited for things to get this bad because in the darkest of the night, my light is going to shine the brightest. I'm going to bring about a deliverance of people from darkness into an eternal light. And then you take into consideration all the prophetic utterances that the Bible talked about. 
Now, what started in Genesis continued and escalated again and again and again further. From every generation, there was a prophetic word that God was reminding. And finally, God comes to Zechariah and Elizabeth and begins the visitation of the prophetic move for that day and that generation about the Messiah that was to arrive. In other words, God was setting up the stage for what he was about to do. I love that phrase. But when the time had fully come, God sent forth his son. We have to understand that God does not do things by chance. He does not do things by accident. He's a God of incredible purpose. He's a God of great intention. He does not do things unintentionally. He plans precisely. Because you can see the evidence of God's detail in the universe that we live in. Even if the sun was off by one degree, even if the sunrise is delayed by a few seconds, it would cause utter chaos in our world today. And I'm sure there are science, scientists who are seated here in our service who can, who can attest to what I'm talking about, how meticulous our universe functions, how precise everything happens, all of it is a testament to the glory and the nature and the character of God. And if God operates with such precision and with such planning and with such incredible destiny, would he not also operate in the same way in your life and in my life as well? Would he not also operate with precision and purpose and destiny? That everything that you go through, that everything that you experience and everything that you've been through, that is allowed by God for something of significance that he wants to do in and through your life, God does not waste nothing. He uses every part of your life, every experience, everything that you see, and everything that you go through. God says, I'm going to use that. I'm going to use that. I'm going to use that. I'm going to build your character. I'm going to do something great in your life with everything that you've been through. Come on, someone. We have an amazing God. And Paul, when he writes this in Galatians 4, he had this revelation within himself about who his God was. And that's why he makes such an incredible statement. He says, but. I love the word but. Do you know why? Because when you use the word but, it makes everything that you said before that meaningless. Right? Hey, I'm going to come to your house, but. That means I'm not coming to your house. Hey, I'm going to buy you a nice Christmas gift, but. So Paul... He begins this statement, but, meaning whatever had happened before that is of no consequence because what I'm about to say is going to change all that you've been through in the past. Come on, someone. God's going to bring you into a season of a but. When God says, but, when the time had fully come. Meaning when God's time comes, no matter what has happened, no matter what you've experienced, no matter what you've walked through, will have no significance or bearing for what he's about to do. Because when God puts in a but, no one can change what he's about to do. And God says, when I, the time has fully come, I will begin a work in the world that will bring about the change and the salvation of an entire mankind. Not just one human being, but an entire mankind. But when the time had fully come, God sent forth his son. Now, the third observation I'm, I'm trying to make here is, what is God trying to say to us from, from that passage? I want to bring to your attention this phrase that I would like to call divine providence. Divine providence. And, and the word providence means the protective care of God. Providence means... God overruling everything because of his care over you. That's a divine providence. And God, God's divine providence was, he moves the entire course of history so that there's no such thing as chance or fate or coincidence. Because nothing ever happens by fate or coincidence with God. Because all things that God does is, is done with incredible planning and an incredible purpose. That's why I love what Charles Spurgeon said. He was called the Prince of Preachers. And he used to say this often. He used to say, there are no loose threads in the providence of God, he would say. Meaning there's no un 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 undone things in the providence of God. God is already taking care of everything when he's about to do something. Maybe you're listening to me this morning and you're wondering, 
How does this apply to me? What does God's providence have to do with me and the problems that I am facing? To you, I would say, it means God is working on your behalf and working in your circumstances to produce something of significance. When the time is right, when the time of God fully arrives, when His time fully is, is comprehended, then you will see the fulfillment of the promises of God concerning your life. Up until then, you have to trust in the divine providence and the nature of God that He will never let you down and He will never forsake you. That's something you and I have. It is to go with God's reputation. <laughs> if there's one thing that's unshakable, it is the reputation of God. Come on, someone. If there's one thing you can build your life on, if you can stake your whole life on, it is God's reputation. Because God has a reputation to never fail. God has a reputation to never forsake. God has a, a reputation to never let go of what He begins. God has a reputation to finish what He starts. And if that's the reputation of God, then you and I are in good hands as long as we stay in the hand of God. Because in the hand of God, there's a providence of God that God will finish what He starts in your life as long as you stay where God is asking you to stay. Come on, someone. That's what I'm talking about is a providence of God. Jesus is and always will be the center of history. I would say history is really his story, planned and told by God. Secular history gives us dates and times and places, but God gives meaning to history. His birth is the hinge on which the door of history swings. He came at the appointed time, Paul says, meaning there was so much meticulous work that God had done so that the time would fully come, so that the ripening of the moment of God will arrive, so that when God began, there would be nothing that would stop what he began. That's the incredibleness of God's work. You know, some people sometimes say, I hope God will meet me halfway. To you, I want to tell you, God never meets anyone halfway. It's not you take one step and then God takes one step. It's not even you take one step and God takes four steps. No. We never have to take any step because God has taken all the steps. You don't have to meet God anywhere. He meets you where you are. Whatever you're going through, He meets you. See, that's the message of Christmas. It is God has taken in Christ a thousand steps to come to where you are and to tell you that I have a plan. I have an incredible work that I want to do in your life. And all the response that God is awaiting from us is to allow Him to do what He came to do. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said to the disciples, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's what God did. He came all the way from heaven looking. Looking for who? For you. For me. And, and you and I would, would agree that looking is a very active state of being. It's not passive, it's active. Waiting is passive, but looking is active. And the, and the Bible says he came seeking and looking to save those that were lost. Meaning, God is seeking you this morning. He's done everything possible to express to us how much He loves us and how much He has an incredible purpose for our lives. And the one thing in response He asks is belief. I love C.S. Lewis, who is a very prolific and renowned author, written several incredible books that has contributed to Christianity. And he writes in one of his books, he says, the Son of God became a Son of Man so that the sons of man might become the sons of God. And I thought that captured pretty much what God did. Son of God came down to earth, became a Son of Man so that us who are nobodies, who had no, who had no rights, 
but no legality to his promises, were suddenly elevated to such a high place. The Bible says even higher than angels. They don't even have the privilege that children of God have to be able to experience his blessing, his grace, and his forgiveness. So this morning when we're just, you know, days away from spending Christmas, I want us to take a few moments here this morning and think about if Christ had not come, where would we be today? Our lives would be the most depraved of all, the most hopeless of all, and has no meaning in it. But Jesus came, and Paul says it so beautifully, when the time had fully come, God sent his son born of a virgin into the world. With one purpose, to take the sins of man and to give us new hope and new life. And that is the greatest hope that we have in Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you this morning. We have an amazing, loving Savior who cares for us, loves us, and he is working in our life all the time. The Bible says the one who looks after Israel, he never sleeps, nor does he slumber. He is always with us regardless of what we're going through and what we're experiencing in our life. And that is something you can take it to the bank because God's word is absolutely certain in its promises. Hallelujah.